So just to tell you how this is going to work, we're going to give each of our panelists an opportunity to present their perspectives around solutions towards preparing the education system towards the fourth industrial revolution. You know, Barack Obama recently said at the Mandela lecture that I was blessed to attend that we can't put education back in a bottle. We can't put technology back in a bottle. So then, if that is the case, how do we then move forward with it so that we're not creating a, an even bigger gap between the haves and the have-nots? Because we already know that there's an information gap that exists um, in our education system. So first and foremost, our speakers will have eight minutes to present their statements, their perspectives, and at the point at which you see me stand up, it, mean, <laughs> it means that you have two minutes to wind down. And that is purely so that we can have more time to engage and get questions from the floor as well. So first and foremost, I'd like to introduce our very first speaker for the day, and that is Dr. Angile Ndotua. A round of applause for him. I'm more focused, I'm going to be more generic than being specific. And this is one of the follow-ups in terms of the education conversation. Actually, the previous conversation talked to me about this topic, where we are saying, we ask a question, is the fourth industrial revolution a reality or a hype? Because we're sitting with a situation whereby when you say it's a hype, maybe you are right. When you say it's a reality, maybe you are right. Maybe let's try and disseminate that and be able to come through with the picture. We spoke to more than 1,000 people where we, I will put a statement to say South Africa does not need to take the fourth industrial revolution seriously as it's just a hype. <laughs> Interesting enough, half of the people say, no, 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 they need to take it seriously because it is not a hype, it is a reality. While the other quarter say, we don't know. The other quarter say, actually, it is a hype. So if I assume that the sampling was as good as it gets. It means that possibly half of us in this room believe that it's a reality. The other quarter believe it's a hype. The other quarter say we don't know. So when you go uh, with the conversation and say maybe this thing is a hype, I won't be surprised because it's a matter of trying to understand why. The reality with fourth industrial revolution have got a lot of things your internet of things, cloud computing, advanced human and machine interface, and so on and so forth. So which means now it's a new era with different things, with different aspects that are coming through. But I'm one of those 50%, and I want to take everyone with us and 100% for us to say it is a reality. Because it's a reality that assists with our jobs. It's a reality that even saves lives. One of the models within that is what is happening in Rwanda, where there are more than 70,000 drones that are delivering medication to people, take blood samples, because they don't have the roads and the infrastructure, and people are far from those amenities. So they say, maybe let's use the fourth industrial revolution to jumpstart the second and the third. Instead of building that, that is why you are seeing that, high, that, uh, that kite, or what you call a drone, going to a village and dropping in education. Even in South Africa, recently you saw Kumba Iron Ore in, in Northern Cape whereby they got some license in a license where now they can do more of the assessment better and it's more safer for people. So surely there's something that is happening here. In places like Zanzibar, it drops the levels 
of your malaria from about 40% to 1% because they use these drones to go and find those estuaries and those habitats of the mosquito, which are the source. So it's even saving lives. The good side is that it has precision, it's good, it improves. The other side is that this is what is happening. You have a situation where instead of us as people doing the building of the walls, you've got a machine that is now building the walls. Actually, when we were doing a research, we encountered a scenario in PE. Then one of my data collectors, when they explained to one of the, of the participants, the fourth industrial revolution, <coughs> that old man said, oh, Nancy Land is telling me savings. And then she was quite fascinated and interested to say, what happened? And they said, no, no, no. They were extending Kuha, and then they expected jobs. And they were even anticipated possibly they would employ about 200 people. But only 20 people were, were employed. And the machines were doing all the work. So, with the good of the fourth industrial revolution, there are things that need the, the opportunities. Some people believe that it will improve us for the reindustrialization, They believe that it will create the jobs. But unfortunately, like the situation in Fort Elizabeth, it will create some social unrest. It will also create some large, large job uh, losses. So the question that comes, and you are the direct and the correct and the relevant people today is to say, what are we gonna do about it? The pertinent question is saying, how do we participate in it? How do we ensure that our children and youth do not get discriminated by it? It's worse because within South Africa, within Africa, we've got one of the biggest number of youth and one of the biggest number that is struggling with the job. Because I can tell you one thing, if we expect them to continue the way they are and not prepare them for the future. I can tell you, they'll be riding that lion and you expect that elephant and you're expecting them to sit steady in the elephant which is just big in a ball. So I hope that the conversation will be about how do we ensure and prepare for fourth industrial revolution, not about whether it exists or not, because it does exist. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Andy Le. We appreciate that presentation. And next up, I'd like to introduce Professor Caroline Long from the University of Johannesburg to give her eight-minute presentation. A round of applause for her. most behind the post revolution, revolution because as you can see I've got <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, welcome to everybody note the title that what this is advertised connections and disconnections within the education value chain which will influence success during the time of the fourth industrial revolution okay so the, the current discussion on the fourth industrial revolution is very important. And it's very important that we all engage with this new idea, but that we bring our intelligence and our experience to bear on the topic. So there are people who have given the topic a great deal of thought and have thought through the implications for education, both in the city and in the rural areas which we can see Andile has, and have ideas about what it means for teacher education. 
These are the people we refer to as experts. However, though they are experts in the field, we should never give up our autonomy and never see our own judgment about what is good for our, commun uh, for our communities. On the other hand, we should also be open to change if change is going to be for the better. Okay, so as um, Mashaba said, my background is a mathematics teacher. And for many years, I struggled with the question of why learners found mathematics so difficult. And I know that the people in the audience here, some of my colleagues and some students who struggled with the same idea. I read much of the research literature. literature. I traveled to the University of Chicago because I thought they had the answer. I also studied remedial education because I thought the secrets may be there. However, a breakthrough came when I read the work of a Frenchman, Gérard Benou. The main idea he, he added was that of conceptual field. Now some of us, if we've come from a farming background, which is me, when we think of the idea of a field, we think of the cows out there or the sheep in the field. But if you're a mathematician, like we've got here, we know that a field, a mathematical field, is made up of um, concepts. Okay, so um, I'm going to explain this in terms of an, a, ma a mathematical example. We have all heard about multiplication, and we know what this is. Maybe only partly. Maybe we know our tables and we know how to get the answer right. But that isn't the end of multiplication. We also know about division, and we know, may know that division is the inverse of multiplication. 5 times 2 gives you 10, 10 divided by 5 gives you 2, and 10 divided by 2 gives you 5. That's what we mean by the division is the inverse of multiplication, which most of our colleagues here know, especially if they're maths teachers here. Then we may know, also know about decimal numbers, about percentages, about ratio and rates, and also about probability, um, which is the most difficult uh, concept that we find in, in primary school. These concepts all together constitute a conceptual field called the multiplicative conceptual field because all of these concepts rely on a deep understanding of multiplication. Okay, having a deep understanding of the number system and, these, and then these operations means that we'll be able to progress to algebra, which is the more abstract notion uh, yeah. and on which all of technology relies. Underneath all of technology, we've got algorithms and we've got algebra, which is informing the technology. But most of us, we just press the buttons on our calculator and we hope that we get the right answer. And sometimes we get the wrong answer when we press, press the buttons on the calculator. And we're most surprised that we got the wrong answer. But the reason we got the wrong answer is that we don't understand the algebra behind how they got the wrong answer. For example, a lot of calculators don't understand what we learned in primary school called bot maths. Remember bot maths? Sometimes our calculators don't know about bot maths and we get the answer wrong. So, and then what goes wrong with the, with the teaching of mathematics? Why is it so difficult? We've all heard that our mathematics education is really bad. We hear that over and over again. But what is interesting to me is that also in countries, advanced countries like the Netherlands, are also very worried about their maths education. Now, the Netherlands started a whole mathematics um, theme, I suppose you could call it, called realistic mathematics education. And this mathematics education relied on um, connecting mathematics with the everyday life of students. And this is suppo was supposed to be a panacea to mathematics. We were supposed to get the answers. We were supposed to all have brilliant mathematicians. But what, um, what happened was when they started doing systemic evaluations, they found that, that, the, that the Netherlands children didn't do that well. So do we say that, well, realistic mathematics education doesn't work? No. In fact, after a lot of soul searching and a lot of in-depth research, 
the, the Netherlands mathematics researchers found that we didn't take the program far enough. While at the beginning stage of mathematics, we connected the everyday life with <coughs> the mathematics, we, we suddenly got cold feet and then we started teaching them procedures. When you get a, a calculation that looks like this, then you do steps one, two, three. When you get a calculation that looks like something else, you do steps four, five, six. So what, what has been happening is that children have lost touch with, what, with, their, with, their, with their own thinking, and they're doing what the teacher says, or they're doing what the textbook says without connecting their own thinking. Okay, so now this is where the idea of conceptual fields comes into play. The deeper mathematics understanding of multiplicative concepts is quite similar, but it is experience and engagement with these many situations that enables students, with the help of the teacher, to gain insight to their sexual mathematics. Now, back uh, to, to, my, to this, uh, well, how does this story, I'm just leaving out a paragraph, but let's see how this goes. <laughs> how does this story link to the fourth industrial revolution? So in my view, the focus on concepts and the linking of ideas from everyday life to the advanced mathematical concepts is key. Once this is in place, the sky's the limit. By linking the technology to the everyday experience and assisting people to make the links, they will benefit. But if we teach technology in little chunks and do not help people to make the connections, the, the, the fourth industrial re revolution will not make it off the ground. And it is only the experts and those people who are advancing the technology that will benefit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Caroline, for that presentation. <coughs> oh my goodness, you see the fourth industrial revolution. I'm so sorry. Um, I'd like to welcome on stage now Ms. Songmo Bamasego. Please give her a round of applause for her presentation. versus what a classroom looks like and versus what we prepare kids. The two are very, very, very different. And the scary part is that for a kid who's in school at the moment and still got another 12 years of school to do, we don't know what that future and reality for them will look like and how different or how similar it is to what we see today. So the reality of applying for the industrial revolution, thinking, expert knowledge into education the reality of it is that we don't actually know what we are preparing kids for. Because by the time they finish the trick, the world will probably look nothing like what it is that we see today, and nothing like the experts' opinions that we are privy to at the moment. What makes it even more concerning is the fact that despite what we currently know about the fourth industrial revolution, we still do not see the education system and classrooms reflecting what it is we already know. Which means not only are we behind based on 12 years worth of progress, but we're just behind based on what we currently already know. I have no words on my slides, only pictures, um, and I'm using the business that I've been part of for the past two and, a, two and a half years as a case study for what is possible and what is crazy implementation that actually turns out to work. In the ECD space, uh, there's a lot of talk about introducing technology at super, super, super young ages. And more and more research is actually showing that that's a persona. More and more research is showing that children at an ECD age are not actually ready to full throttle have technology thrown in their faces to teach them every single thing. It goes back down to the principle of kids at a preschool age actually deal less in concepts but more in concrete. 
And therefore, even something as simple as teaching a child to count to 10 and counting out the words 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is actually conceptual, which is shown not to actually stick in the mind of a child who's under the age of 6. What they actually need to know is feel one, touch, touch one, taste one, right? Smell one and then later be introduced to conceptual ideas, which is currently how we um, uh, pretty much approach it. But also I think in the fourth industrial revolution, what is becoming more and more important is people's sense of agency and the individualism that a child has to progress at their rate, to explore their own interests and explore their own skills. A lot of how we structure education does not speak to that sense of agency. It does not speak to a child figuring out what they're good at. It does not speak to exploration. It speaks to defy all chances of failure by all costs. Where at this age, it's even more important for kids to experiment and actually fail. If we look at the basic education space, yeah, if we look at the basic education space, and I look at my uh, personal experience, and I'm sure everyone's experience, is that the world is not siloed up in subjects. When you can take an approach with a problem, it's not told to you that this comes out of your grade 5 algebra mathematics syllabus, and you'll find it on page 63 of the textbook you used at that grade. But the reality is that the problems that come up in the world require you to take your toolbox of information and tools from subjects, from life experience, from technology, and build solutions that make sense for those problems. In a continent where we have tons of problems and very young people to solve them, we do ourselves a disservice in the way that we teach in a siloed, this is mathematics, this is English, this is Afrikaans. A good example is that top right-hand picture of the kids with the sundown. These were grade two kids. We had only had them for about three to six months and they did a project called the History of Time. And what they did was that we integrated their mathematics, their um, English, as well as life sciences. In life sciences, we started getting them a sense of the African continent and the concept of different countries in Africa are in different time zones. In mathematics, we started teaching them around reading analog time. In English, we got their research skills up and allocated them all a country on the continent and got them to do some research. And then we got them to physically now back to kind of techno uh, technology studies and mechanical studies and using your hands to build their own sundial. And then we got them clocks and said, unscrew the clock and paste in information about your African country and set the time to the time that it is in your African country and put your clock back up. And in that grade two, grade three classroom, which is a joint project, they now have a wall of time zones across the African continent. That is the real world very different to how we currently teach on a relative basis across um, the cross divide. It was another practical example that first picture on the left is around using artificial um, reality in the classroom. There's a particular mining company that no longer does safety checks by making you go out at 250 meters above ground and walk out onto a, a platform to see if you can actually do tasks while up there. There's a company that's built them an artificial reality solution. Looks very much like that. And in that artificial reality solution, they're able to mimic their safety procedures and see whether you would do well at high, high, um, big, high altitude level and be able to actually do actual work. And that's how they decide whether to hire or not hire people nowadays. Then in higher education and training, I think this links back to whether we prepare teachers to teach kids who are in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution. I think for me, currently, the answer is no. And I put up some of these examples specifically around professions. So specifically around professions, if you look at the top right-hand corner with Watson, Watson, an IBM tool, is currently replacing the work of lawyers. Watson can study legal textbooks quicker than a human being can and can apply the law with less error margin than humans can. The bottom left hand corner is robotic surgery. As a doctor, going out into the world, you are actually now able to do microscopic surgeries using robots instead of your hands. On the bottom right hand side for engineers, we're supposed to be teaching to create doctors, engineers. That is a bridge being built by robots in Amsterdam which this is the model, and it will actually be built, is being built in real life in 
Amsterdam to take volumes of cars and trucks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Masego. Another round of applause for her, please. So thank you so much to all three of our panelists. And now we're getting to the juice, the crux. And so I would like, by show of hands, um, those of you who've got questions, who've got comments, who've got um, solutions towards how we can prepare our education system for the fourth industrial revolution, raise your hands, we will take notes of you, and then we'll try and give as many of you an opportunity to contribute to the conversation as possible. There's so many factors to consider in this, because quite honestly, we cannot ask, are we? as an education system ready for the fourth industrial revolution? The answer is obvious. We are not entirely ready. And there are schools that are still lagging behind. So we are fully aware of the problems, and we are all here today so that we can put our heads together. I want to hear from teachers who are in the room. Do you feel prepared, and how can you be upskilled in order to be fully prepared to embrace the fourth industrial revolution? For those of you who are still asking, what is the fourth industrial revolution? Um, you are also more than welcome. Your questions are valid. So is, where is the roving mic? And who do we have first? We've got a lady at the back there. Uh, and then we'll come to the lady right there in the front, because I saw your hand first. If you would kindly just give us your name and tell us who you represent or what you represent, and then get into your question. Hi to everyone and thank you for this opportunity. I'm Edna Chisano and I'm from Plain Cows of Josie and I'm also a BN student at the University of Johannesburg. I'm majoring in ICT and economics. So firstly when I had this, the first speaker which was Mr. Andile, the first uh, point that I picked up there is the lack of jobs. The, that's the most part that we as teachers are scared of because if you introduce the technology to us, we are wondering, are we still going to have this opportunity to teach? We're taking the jobs by doing it there. That's the fear they have. And then also going to Mrs. Sonom, what she mentioned was very important because as, as I mentioned that I'm doing my fourth year in, for education, the most challenge that I get when I'm going to do my practicals is I, I fail to apply what I learned from the university applied into the children um, level. So the biggest thing again is what we learn at the university is a bit different from what we get in the classroom. And I think again what she mentioned that from a young age we need to teach those kids because if you teach a grade 10 learner how to use a computer or else they don't even know how the computer looks like from a young age it's very difficult. Thank you. Right there, the back with the glasses. <laughs> Sorry, the lady who's majoring in ICT, what did you say her name was? Ed Nachisano. Ed Nachisano. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, and I've got a question for Sonoma. 
And so uh, I want to understand what does your guys' report cards look like for future uh, future schools, right? So what, what do you guys assess on? Because I see, and then I really applaud um, what you guys are doing. Um, and as far as the how, how, how you guys have innovated um, around teaching. And, um, and in terms of, you know, just a general question, um, going back to what we've touched on, um, to say what should we then uh, be teaching kids? Because you, the, the last slide was showing, you know, how basically engineers or, or guys that actually build bridges physically are not needed. What should we then be teaching kids? Thank you very much for that question. Very powerful. Um, we have the lady in the black and red at the back there, and then we'll take it from there. All right, when you get the microphone, if you can please stand up Thanks. for us. Um, Sorry, Banani. I think I need to use my teacher voice, because this is not working. Um, my name is Dudu, I'm from the Click Foundation. Um, we attended an education summit a couple of weeks ago, and I just thought in the spirit of sharing is caring, I'll just read out a slide that I took, and it was also around the fourth industrial revolution, and it said the skills, the 21st century education, this is what people, kids need to be taught, and it was knowledge, skills, and character, and they had put up a slide of 10 things, or 10 skills that teachers need to teach. And my question is really around how do you equip your educators to be able to teach these skills? And it's as follows. Complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, people management, coordinating with others, emotional intelligence, judgment and decision making, service orientation, negotiation, and cognitive flexibility. And my question is really around the education centers or the education colleges. Are they teaching educators to enable them to teach these skills that are touted to be the skills of the future and the skills of the 21st century? Thanks. Thank you very much. All right, we'll take one more question before we continue, and then we'll continue to take more questions. There's a lady in the front that's had her hand very really way high up from the beginning. <laughs> you look like a very young, vibrant student, so if you can please just bring the microphone closer to her. She's in the blue. Um, Laser. Um, good afternoon to everyone. And I have a question for Dr. Anne The first question is, as much as the reality of the first industrial revolution has like, registered in the minds of most individuals here, will we ever have free quality education where most students my age will be exposed to different types of technology? And my second question is to Ms. Songhova. Um, what is more significant in the fourth industrial revolution is the qualifications or the experiences that are able to get you a well paid job. Thank you very much. Mm, very good. Thank you so much. So we'll just pause on the engagement for, for a second. Um, and by the way, these questions that have been raised, anyone in the audience is more than welcome to contribute towards the answers and the solutions. So we've had a number of very interesting questions, some of them being, um, you know, how is the invisible future, invisible internet going to impact our society. Another being, you know, what should we be teaching our kids in light of the fourth industrial revolution, but also how do we equip our educators in order to be able to teach um, these future skills that we speak of? Is there anyone in the panel or in the audience who'd like to address um, any one of these particular issues that have come up so far? And of course the issue of the fourth industrial revolution really compromising human resources. What's going to happen to our jobs? Dr. Andy. Okay. Uh, I want to, to start with, with the lack of job but they have. I think it's, it's, it's quite critical for us to understand that within every aspect of a problem, we as human beings needs to be there to try and solve. As much as there can be a lack of job or possibly job losses, that is already creating a glacial call to us to say, prepare people for the right jobs. And what are those type of education that needs to be there? This includes your STEM education. 
in terms of <coughs> your engineering, your mathematics, your technology, and your science, I'm talking uh, backwards, they become quite critical because, like Prof was talking about, you're talking algorithms, you're talking about those interfaces. There are a lot of skills that are required that are needed in order to create those jobs. And where I'm sitting, one of the major challenges goes down to the TVEC colleges and goes down to the University of Technologies because they are structured to be application-based, even more than your normal traditional institutions. In this day of fourth industrial revolution, they should be striving rather than being the followers. So that's why, that's my view. I think then the jobs, it might be temporary, but if we do better, we can create opportunities. That's one question. The second question, which was more directed to me, again going back to the quality of education. Because at the end of the day, we need to say we are part of a global society. And if we do not create quality education and bring identity to it, we will be left behind. That lady, when I was interviewing her the other day, and I'm actually calling all of you to, to look at this, she said, the people are doing algorithms. They bring their own identity. And if now you can go to your cell phone now and go to Google and Google cute baby and look at the image. Please go to go go to your internet and look at cute baby and look at the image and understand if you can identify those cute babies. Ms. <laughs> Chaba has got a very beautiful hair. Go to your you. internet, same internet and put beautiful hairstyle and see what I see. She's not in vain, right? So we need to make sure that we are part of it, we make those solutions so that we become part of the bigger picture. Are you seeing what I'm talking about? Would anyone else like to contribute towards that before we move on to the next um, questions? Yes, so we've got a gentleman in the back in the gray um, jersey. If we can get the roving mic to him. What is your name, Dad? All right. Uh, my name is Miami Gomarola, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm sorry. Please. Miami Gomarola. My amigo. Yes. Hi, how, how do you spell that? M A Y A. Yes. M I. Yes. K O. Okay, that. Yes. I think my teacher's voice is loud enough. <laughs> <laughs> it sure All right. is. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, in the first place, ladies and gentlemen, I would be a little controversial. Uh, in the sense that when we are talking about the fourth industrial revolution, it seems the fear that uh, touches all of us is the loss of jobs. Mm -hmm. But to my own understanding, I would like to contend to say in the fourth industrial revolution, no jobs will be lost. But rather, I would like to agree with Dr. Andley to say there will be some skills that will be needed for those jobs which we currently don't have. If you look at all those robotics that you showed us in the presentation, those ones will not just come on their own. They will be made by people, isn't it? Those machines will be maintained by people. So the fact is there will be no loss of jobs but all we need are the skills that shall be required in that particular time. So in my exploration of the topic, I mean the whole, I mean the outlook of the fourth industrial revolution. They say during this particular period, problem solving is one of the important skills that will be needed because problems shall always be there in our workplaces. Problems shall always be there with our robotics. So people, we need to have problem solving skills. We need to have critical thinking in order for us to approach the problem that will come with the fourth industrial revolution. We need to have creative skills in order for us to be able to come up with, sol uh, I mean, to come up with solutions 
to solve some of the problems required. Now, you know, what did you say you do for a living? I'm studying at the University of Johannesburg, Bachelor of Education in, the, in Childhood Education. All right, so maybe we need to unpack. You've made some very valid points here, very valid points about how we could transition and prepare for the very fourth good. industrial let me, revolution. Let me just finish. I hope and, I, I and in your wrapping up, if you yes. could kindly address, you said that no jobs will be lost. Yes. I, 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 pers I mean, how many people believe that no jobs will be lost by show of hands? I'll say more. So, if, if you know, there, there are sort of there's an imbalance in, in, in that belief system. Well, that's that, that's my assumption. That's in, my in opinion. In any transition, we, we gain some and we lose some, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. How do we transition so that we prepare people not to permanently lose their jobs? All right. Uh, to my understanding, looking at the whole education system, I think now our curriculum needs to shift to focus on inquiry-based learning or problem-solving uh, approach. I think in that way, we're going to be able to equip our learners with the skills that will be required in the fourth industrial revolution. So we have to revisit our education curriculum. Thank you. Thank you so much, my amigo. All right, is, um, is anyone that like to comment or are there any more questions on the floor? Um, sure, Ms. Maseko, if we can just hand over to you to, to answer Sorry. one of the questions. I think there's one, um, there one question that was asked by two people raised around how we, and it links up well what's just been said, about how we teach our teachers to teach kids for the fourth industrial revolution, right? Especially with that list of skills that we're saying is important. I think the, the reality is that we first have to look at what's working, what's not working, but also what's relevant versus what's not relevant. The biggest problem would be if something that we're getting right in teacher education is actually not relevant, which I think some of the stuff that we currently do sits in that bucket. Um, part of it for me is we can't expect teachers to go out and teach children about technology if they themselves have not been exposed to and taught about technology. We cannot expect teachers, even in an um, inquiry-based learning setting, to get them to get kids to use technology to solve problems if we ourselves have not even been able to solve some of our teacher problems with technology. So just for some of the things um, I've seen specifically is our teachers aren't ready to do what we're asking them to do. It requires a fundamental mindset shift and complete openness from our teachers to actually pull that off. And then it also requires a lot of support, a lot of development, right, and a lot of training for our teachers, not just on a once-off basis, where you finish your degree and then you're done, but on a continual basis while you are in service at a school so that we're actually able to keep up with what's happening, but also so that we avoid teachers almost falling back into the norm of what it is that worked before that we're saying is not working anymore. Mm -hmm. So some of the things that we specifically implemented was, so all of our teachers undergo quite a hectic, intensive onboarding that teaches them the principles of project-based learning and inquiry-based learning. Um, they go through quite a lot of time assessing and shadowing other teachers who have already been in that system to assess how they teach. And then the other thing is that we require our teachers to complete 144 hours of CPD or continuous professional development every year, which means that every teacher at least one hour in the week is doing something. And that something may be, sounds silly, but for some of the teachers it's social media training. For another teacher, it's how do we teach you to use an assessment platform to use in your classroom. For another teacher, it's back to principles of project-based learning. For another teacher, it is let's give you a deep dive in a corporate on how they use technology that relates to science or mathematics and how do you bring that back into your classroom. So it's got to be as practical for the teachers as we're saying it must be practical for the students. And that doesn't happen overnight. So we wish we could say this and everyone's on the same page, but what it means is that it's progressive training, progressive development, continuous development, and assessment thereof to make sure that it's actually working. The question about how we assess students, so I think the first thing is 
we often ask the question about how we can use technology to scale education. And I think it's one of my favorite questions because very oftentimes people say, just use technology and scale access to rural areas and everywhere. But we never question what are we scaling? Should we be scaling what we currently have? Sometimes the answer is no, no. So what we've done is actually looked at our curriculum, looked at our subjects, we've introduced subjects like African studies, so that the context of this continent is part and parcel of our curriculum. We've introduced subjects like coding and, and programming for the obvious reason, and we've introduced leadership and entrepreneurship, and then taken that with the standard subjects and curriculum, and put them outside of their silos to apply to real life problems. So you solving your problem borrows a little bit from maths, borrows a little bit from English, borrows a little bit from, from African studies. And therefore the assessment is not just an exam. Yes, we still do exams, tests, cycle tests, all of that. But some of it is peer critique, some of it is self-reflection, and a lot of it, so we're trying to balance summative and formative assessments to make up how we assess how well or not well the student is doing. And same goes for the teachers how well or not well the teacher is doing and what we're asking them to do and how do we support them to get to where we need to get them to. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Maseko. Um, before we take more questions on the floor, is there anything you'd like to address, Professor? Um, yeah, I just want to... Um, let's take an example uh, of our teachers. Where one feels a need for something, one is going to learn and want to yeah. learn it. So how can we set up situations which, where the technology is satisfying a need? Yes. And this is, a, this is a very simple example, but um, for, for most of you, uh, the adding up of marks and the, the sorting out of marks, if you get into Excel, it's such a lovely tool. I'm sure probably most of the people are in Excel already, but I just find that that's such a, a lovely way of getting into technology and it takes hours <coughs> out of your time. Thanks. Thank you very much. So for more questions on the floor, we will, okay, we already have a, a gentleman with a microphone there with a lovely haircut. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, Andile and Songo both gave great examples, concrete examples of technologies. Okay, is it fine? Okay. okay. okay am I heard? Yeah, we okay. do. So, yeah, they gave great examples of technologies. But what I found problematic was that those are imported technologies from the global north to the south. And Caroline raised the point about bringing our experience to bear. So then how do we promote a transculturality that is not just Eurocentric or Afrocentric, but rather provides um, a, a base of hybridity in our education system? Well, that's <laughs> and, um, no, I love it. I love it. Well, I just have a comment for Usamuabo. So, so, I hope I pronounce it correctly. You definitely um, address the point about resources that that young lady um, spoke about, that subtext, both with human and financial and our teachers and so on. But what I found problematic is your sort of like exposition that our ed education system operates in silos. To a certain extent, I do agree but its, it's, it's context is it's very integrated. Its content, even, is quite integrated. I guess what's important is merging that content with the human resources. Wow. Yeah. But by the way, do you write? Uh, no. You should. Thank you. You're English. You're, you're so, I could listen to you speak all day. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Transculturality. <laughs> Damn. All right. Um, would anyone from the floor like to answer? Should we take two more questions and then we'll give an opportunity to the panel? All right. Um, shall we go to, yes, the gentleman in the black and then we'll go to the gentleman just behind him and then you had a chance to speak. Yeah. And then we'll go to the gentleman just behind you. Okay. My name is Richard Gottfried. I'm just trying to think that uh, if we take some steps back, when we started seeing sci-fi movies, 
many of you will recall things like uh, the eye robot and so on and so on. <laughs> and we try to think about the uh, ATS from today. Uh, isn't it uh, we are fighting for the lost battle? In that uh, perhaps it's the fourth industrial revolution, it says you have become instinct will do things for you. Find something else to do. <laughs> Go to philosophize, do all of these things. That's what we'll do. Why are we, we seem to be fighting for the lost battle, if we really believe in that revolution in this classical sense. Is it need that we need to do something? Because if we look back to the original sci-fi movies, it was a society of the rich. We can afford the robots, they will do their jobs, it cleans, they go and fish and do other things. They don't have to work. Mm. What we seem to be battling is we want to work. We can't afford to lose our jobs. Perhaps we need to think something differently. It's a battle that we are not going to win. I don't sure. know. That's a very valid point. Thank you very much for that. So we need to move yeah, towards respond the class. To um, I would just quickly like to uh, respond to uh, the gentleman's st uh, statement is very, very true. But if one looks into the literature, we find that in Africa, what we see as our disadvantages actually seem to be our advantages in this fourth industrial revolution. For instance, things like unemployment and uh, lack of skills. We must remember that we are moving into a time where we have not even thought of certain job descriptions. So Africa compared to Europe, and other parts of the world. We have got a, a, a chance, they use the term, I think the gentleman will uh, enjoy it very much. We have got the opportunity to leapfrog the West. And actually, if we stand up together with uh, the Chinese, we have got an opportunity to leapfrog the rest of the world in terms of uh, uh, technological advancement and even job creation. So people should not be worried about losing jobs. Yes, at the current context, there is a possibility if we do things the way we are doing them right now, yes, many jobs might be lost, but the only thing that is limiting this uh, uh, industrial revolution is our imagination, and the imagination is boundless. So let us start solving problems, like Mr. Madora said. Thank you very Thank much. You. But then we'll get to you have not told us who you are. Oh, uh, I am okay, so uh, I am a representative of the University of Johannesburg, the Faculty of Education, and um, yes, I'm part of the committee that organized the event. Thank you very much. I know we're in the fourth industrial revolution, but we're not there yet where we can, you know. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that far where we can just see on our ears who you are. All right, so who's got the microphone now? Yes, sir, please tell us who you are. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I remain, I remain in Oktivani, UJFRC. In fact, when it comes to the context of fourth industrial revolution, it's quite a import, important and a good initiative to a, a nation as a whole and the world. In fact, I can say that uh, I'm fortunate enough that yesterday I was attending one of the uh, programs regarding fourth industrial revolution yesterday, as it was presented by the vice chancellor of the institution. Uh, I asked him an important question as well saying that if we are saying we are going to a fourth industrial revolution, what we are trying to say is that robots are going to replace human. To me, he said, no, that's not what I'm saying. Because robots, there are certain things that they cannot do. For example, they cannot go to the toilet. They cannot make love. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Oh, oh. They there are robots that can make love. I'm still going there. I'm still going there. As, as I'm still unpacking, you don't have to jump before the gun shot. No, I have to correct you. There are robots that can make love. Also, did you read did you read the article that states that in, 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 in nineteen fifty five robots are going People are going to have a relationship with robots. Well, I've read that article. I've read that article. But what I'm trying to say to you is that robots cannot make life. They, they won't have the same feelings that are, 
uh, I don't know how to better explain it. You understand? Yeah. 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 And now, if I hear what people are saying, they are saying that we are going to lose jobs and whatsoever. It's all about supposition versus uh, uh, assumptions. What I can say to you is that people are not going to lose jobs. Those who are going to lo lose jobs is those who are uneducated. Because they say whoever who teaches learn in a form of teaching, and whoever who te uh, uh, learns teach in a form of learning. That's how is it. So what I'm trying to say to you is that in the fourth industrial revolution, it was all about uh, knowledge formulation. Second industrial revolution, it was all about knowledge evolution. Third industrial revolution, it was about knowledge distribution. So now we're on the fourth industrial revolution where we have to act. It's quite elusive to say uh, people are going to lose jobs or they are going to gain jobs. But what we can say for now is that we need to make it a point that we, 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 we demo, demodify our education system. As the president is announcing the 16th of December, saying that there's free decommodified education. In that context, when we say we're moving to a fourth industrial revolution, are we going to say that since education is free, are we going to create a globe that people are going to access education at anywhere, at any place. Because at this time, for, for example, if we speak about a uh, digital age, there's what you call soft learning. Where, where, when you log into Facebook, you, you post your picture there, it can detect that uh, the, uh, this person is in Okutibana, as it's my name, without even telling or even, without even writing that this is your, uh, your, your, your picture. It can detect that. Therefore, in that, con in, in that context, we need to dwell much in deep learning of uh, what you call fourth industrial revolution. Uh, uh, moving right along, there's another article as well that we have to read about uh, Bill Gates. He, 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 he announced on the 20th of March 2017 where he speaks that uh, robots need to, to be taxed. Meaning that all these people that are going to create robots they're going to be taxed, which is going to contribute to our economy. Regardless that uh, the tax is 15% in South Africa, but they're going to be taxed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So for, um, we're going to take about three more questions on the floor for now, um, and then allow the, the panel to respond, and then we'll continue with our engagement. We'll come this side. So many hands have been up this side. And just so that we come back to the reason why we are here. We are fully aware of the problems. Every single person in this room is aware of the challenges, right? How do we prepare our education system for the fourth industrial revolution? I'd love to hear more solutions. Who's next? Yes, uh, My name is Heather. I'm a foundation-based teacher. And my question is, is a question similar to what you were saying now, how. Um, one of the problems that I face and that I've seen a lot of young teachers face when they come into schools, I've only worked in the government sector, is teachers come in excited and creative with technology, with skills, young teachers in particular, and within three months, one term, they stop. Because there is so much pressure from their HRD, from their district office, from their school system, saying that's not how we do it, that's not policy, that's not standardized. And my question is how to just continue to fight this uphill battle because as a teacher, it's exhausting. What exhausts you the most? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I think the, the thing that exhausts me the most, honestly, is, is when HODs or SMTs quote policy, that, that that's not policy. And, and I disagree because I've read CAPS <laughs> and I've read policies and I've read the South African Schools Act and it, it, 
it doesn't prevent us from using Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> right. It doesn't. So it's just, yeah, I think that for me is the hardest part of the fight is when people are trying to use things like policy to put, and, and in a young teacher who's not necessarily feeling that confident, they often just stop, oh, okay, if it's not policy, I won't, as opposed to fighting back. And it's, it's sad to see it all over, to just constantly see teachers withdraw and, and fall in line with, I mean, like we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution. I'd be surprised if the third industrial revolution is in some in most mm -hmm. classrooms. You know, it's, Got you. we're not, we're talking about something long ago. So. Thank you so much. That, that helps a lot. Thank you. Uh, yes. Educators won't be to go teach people. 
will be dumber than the people. It will be for go facilitate that learning. Right. If I'm racist and I wanna learn about other racist things, I can just go on YouTube and watch what I wanna see, my perspective. <laughs> so for a teacher, it will be facilitate that I go into other um, views. I don't just stick to what I want to watch. Because currently the internet is based on if I like cars, Instagram will show me cars. Mm. So for a teacher, it's if I like cars, tell me about trucks or aeroplanes so that I, people don't have just one objective. Because currently people become too extremist. I'm a Muslim, I become too much of a Muslim because I watch too much Muslim things. So for teachers, it, it will be facilitated, I don't know how on, on the internet, but you oh. won't be in a building, that's for sure. You won't have that type of job. You'll probably work in your bedroom too. <laughs> facilitating in your bedroom. That one billion people that now facilitating 20 students that are probably at UJ. Well, now this is must fall, but before when I got here, it was just 10 names of students. The rest of us are from well our families. So imagine how many ideas were closed out of learning because they couldn't afford, you know? Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for that. Another major issue that exists is the obvious information gap in the education system. So how do we think around equipping um, children who study in schools in the rural areas, equipping them for the fourth industrial revolution? Some people spoke about the fourth industrial revolution, like in Germany, as, as uh, early as 2011. So, when we start talking about this on a daily basis, if you look at the research, we already seven years or six years down the line. We're already starting to wait. So, our job is to make sure that we can structure the, show, the, 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 the revolution and bring identity such that we become central and become central participant so that we don't lose those jobs and if that job is lost it's temporary because there are skills that are being developed and i think for us that is the most critical part and within the education space these are the people these are the stakeholders which can shape the future we need to break those barriers of the policy. What is happening, what uh, you are talking about is the same thing uh, in the previous education conversation where one of the people within the audience said, you are having a problem whereby you are teaching zombies in so far as the kids because you've been asked 70%, 80%, 90% pass rate, the kids are just claiming in order to pass the metric. Unfortunately, I think it's a challenge for all of us to say, how do we make sure such that we don't get into trouble? So, job loss, we can talk about it, but the opportunities are even better and for us to strike, to strike and, and, and structure our future. Thank you very much, Doctor. So we are just a couple of minutes before closing off our conversation. I'd like to give um, each of our remaining panelists one minute to just close off, okay, two minutes, to just, <laughs> I saw that look, Professor. <laughs> two minutes to just give a closing statement, especially in light of some of the questions and comments that have come from the floor. <laughs> okay. I think this idea of, uh, human agency for, for me is very important. 
another way of saying there's no limit. And I think we need to celebrate the idea of agency in each human being, in each teacher, in each worker. Um, yeah, and certainly in each teacher. And for example, our young teachers, when they're in schools, they sh or, and even the, the, the teachers that we seem to be more stuck in policy, that they identify a problem and they find a solution, either individually or with a whole lot, and then you look for how can this best be solved. And we open, open up the solutions to include technology, to include all manner of things. But, but I think the answer is in human agency, and then certainly um, that we don't limit that, that we see in each of us, here, in each, of us, each teacher, each worker, each human being, each person, this idea of agency and not limitation. Thank you very much. Ms. Maseko? I definitely want to echo the kind of agency position. I think it's, if anything, we can decide as individuals whether we will be victims of the fourth industrial revolution or whether we will be part of driving the fourth industrial revolution or what we want that to be. If anything, the technological advances actually allow you the opportunity to amplify your efforts, amplify your interests, do things a lot quicker and more efficiently than you are able to do, and this notion of, are we, den are we in denial? Potentially the fourth industrial revolution means that we will actually need a much better quality of life, doing the things that we enjoy doing, the things that we are passionate about, and they won't feel like a job, potentially, because all the shit and admin of being a teacher, there will be a little robot to do my admin for me, and I can focus on engagement with <laughs> <laughs> So my big thing is just like to look at people's industrial revolution as a person who wants to impact it and drive it and use it towards achieving your own objectives, rather than looking at the whole industrial revolution as something that's happening to us. Thank you so much, Ms. Maseko. A round of applause for our panel, ladies and gentlemen. So before I welcome our final speaker for closing remarks and vote of thanks, uh, the Dean Zo Nebutalu from Gahiso Trust, I'd just like to remind you all that, you know, it, it, unfortunately, you know, we would all love to be here until 9 o'clock at night. I personally, I would love to be here until tomorrow morning. Um, but for those of you who haven't had an opportunity to speak or to, to put your questions across, the conversations are not ending. This is a movement. These are not one-off conversations. So please make sure that you tweet at Gahiso underscore trust, at go to UJ with the numerical two, whatever questions or comments, contributions, and um, be part of the solutions. Let's keep it going. We have one more conversation of our Education Conversations series coming up this year. So really, this is a commitment. It really is from all of us, and we need you for this. So um, just a reminder that if you haven't already registered, please register so that you get your contact details. And this information is absolutely vital in order for us to keep track of, of you and that we can keep engaging and informing you of our upcoming conversations and how you can continue to be part of the solution. We also have feedback forms that we'll kindly ask you to leave at the door. I'm sure each of you would have already filled them out by now. If you haven't already, please take the next couple of minutes to do so, and please make sure that you leave your feedback forms at the door. It's also very vital towards us really making progress as part of our education conversations. And remember when you continue the conversations online, so it's the hashtag education conversations as you tag at Gahiso underscore trust and at go to UJ as well. And also a video of today's conversation. The entire video will be available for you on our YouTube channel and that is Gahiso Trust. So you are more than welcome to watch the conversation, share the conversation, keep the conversation going, and most certainly keep the solutions coming more than anything. So on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome for our final closing remarks and vote of thanks, the Dean Zwo Nebutalu from Gahisa Trust. A round of applause.
we need to jump it, cut it part of it. So that is why I was saying this is a conversation for the nation. We need, we need to be able to talk about it. But there was something very close to my heart which came out here. And, and it's very important. I want to be able to bring it here to the fore. In, in 2015, in South Africa, 269,593 learners wrote mathematics and mathematics. In 2016, the number dropped to 265,757. In 2017, the number dropped further to 177,961,000. And out of that, out of the people who wrote the check, only throughout the years, except in 2017, only 30% of them managed to get 60%, between 60% and 100. 30%. One, three. One, three. One, three. The, the professor asked, the the professor the asked the question, why learners find mathematics difficult? Why, why do we have this kind of a situation? I think that's something we must talk about. But, but a few years ago, maybe three or four years ago, we went to visit our patron, Bishop Desmond Tutu. When we arrived there, we said to him, if one day you were to do a project this kind of time, in your honor, uh, what kind of a project should we do? He never, never thought twice. He said that project must have something to do with educators. Educators are the most important people. He says the moment he thinks about the people who in his life who actually shaped him, molded him. The people, the people who come, come through to his mind are educators. So, so maybe, maybe educators hold, hold some, some of the keys for us to discuss into uh, the issue of getting learners excited, loving, loving mathematics. I know, I know, for instance, I did my I did a little bit of mathematics. When, when I, I, I also used to think mathematics was a bit difficult. In fact, I was told every day that mathematics was difficult. Every day, by my educator, he used to say, mathematics is very difficult. But when I did mathematics one, you know, when I was doing BSc, I did mathematics one. We got a lecturer who came, teaching us from the US. I have never, mathematics was so interesting. I know, you know, you have to yeah. just be doing with them it is all the time. He made it very, very interesting. He was a lecturer. So, so one, one of the reasons why learners are trying to fight mathematics very difficult is educators. Is educators. If educators love mathematics, learn mathematics, master mathematics, we know that most of the educators don't even understand mathematics. When I was studying education, there were, there were uh, assessments made for, 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 for educators. They wrote the same papers of the mathematics level they were teaching. And the majority of them failed. So if the person was teaching mathematics in grade 7, they wrote a paper for grade 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, they failed it. So you can. So you can imagine, you can play the kids and say, why are they not? <laughs> why are they not? So, I think you can do J for instance. You can start by making uh, among the educators mathematics exciting, they can be exciting to the rest. I was very, very pleasant uh, uh, over joy when I received, when I went to the free state. I did something very interesting because when we went to the free state, where we have a project there, we were told that some of the schools that produce the best, best results 
in terms of mathematics. Uh, uh, where, where learners are taught by young, young educators. So it means something is beginning to happen as far as uh, teachers are concerned. But I think teachers are very, very important indeed. And, and so, so I'm not here to make a speech. I need to carry on with the list. <laughs> the people I have to say. They said I must thank the partners. UJ Faculty of Education. I must thank the panelists and indeed the Ghana is very, very proud. I was very, very proud.